Hello. Welcome and thank you for joining me for wherever you are and joining us here for our 13th annual Bach at St. Bartholomew's. Uh, we're certainly exploring new territory as you are. Uh, we've never done this this way before. I'm not sure we know what we're doing, but we'll find out. But anyway, so glad you could join us today and for the first of two concerts this year. Bach to Italy is the theme today. And I need to turn off the volume on my monitor. Hey, we're learning. So where was I? Yes, Italy, that's where I was. Um, but not today's Italy, but the Italy of a, some time ago. So at the time of Bach's lifetime, um, some really exciting new music was coming out of Italy and it was creeping its way up into Northern Europe despite that, that great geographical barrier known as the Alps. And it was exciting a lot of people, especially a lot of composers. We don't have much evidence that Bach ever traveled very far south, but he certainly learned every way that was available to him. And what was that? That was books, scores that were published and shipped northward. Uh, musicians who were either from Italy and traveling through the area or in some cases there were actually quite a lot of German musicians who were traveling to Italy in order to study and then they were bringing back their new skills so this sort of traveling musician publishing closest thing to the internet of the day and the word and uh, the craft was getting around and as I said uh, it was exciting quite a few people the uh, Italian music, um, you might recognize some of the terms from, from this music. Uh, words like sonata, words like cantata, toccata. Uh, other words like allegro, adagio, larghetto, words like that. So box time was the time that words like these started to get used everywhere. I mean, you weren't anybody as a composer unless you knew these Italian words and you used them in your music. This is when that became a thing. So the, in, in, a, in a case of something like a sonata, a sonata basically just means a piece for a musical instrument. Sonata comes from the same word as sound, um, as opposed to a cantata, which was for a singer. It was, it was something to be sung. Or a toccata, which was a piece to be played on a keyboard. And that's all those words really meant originally. Um, but they began to take on more meaning with, with, over the course of time. What happened is these sonatas, these toccatas, which began as like these, these pieces, oh, how would you describe them? They, they were sort of like little sections, little musical vignettes. Um, within a larger piece. So the, a sonata might start with sort of a florid part and then following that might be a slower, more meditative part and then it would end with a more fantastic florid part. Usually a sort of fast, slow, fast kind of pattern. But these were just sections of a piece. These weren't like anything that would claim to be able to stand on its own as its own piece. But that changed over time. These, these sonatas grew into larger forms and became what we would now call three movement works. So now you have almost three separate pieces that are meant to happen in succession. I sometimes wonder what inspired this might not have been um, opera. Now Italy is the place where opera started and I think this fascination with the, the grand telling of a story which on stage would take the form of, among other things, a scene followed by another scene, followed by another scene. And in between the scenes, there might be set changes or uh, in the modern theater, there might be different lighting or something like that. And so I think what maybe happened with these larger sonatas, um, concerti, um, is, is sort of the musical version of that here's a scene, and then now the story takes a turn and there's another scene. I have nothing whatsoever to actually prove that was the inspiration. Just a random thought of mine. I have no idea what validity it has. But it seems to me it makes some sense that 
this really took this, this thing of three separate movements and contrasting in their style. So that fast, slow, fast pattern of the earlier sonata, a single piece, became three almost individual pieces, a faster one, a slower one, and a fast one, usually following that pattern. So, um, if you think about a composer like Antonio Vivaldi, for example, and, and you're probably familiar with the music and, and are familiar with the, the sort of buoyant, happy, energetic feel it has, um, this, I think, was appealing to the German composers and composers elsewhere, too. So one of the things that uh, Bach did in order to sort of absorb this music was he began taking some of these concerti, these sonatas, these, yeah, concerti and sonatas, and adapting them. Of course, they were originally written for concerti and sonatas were originally written for um, instrumental ensembles, like a string orchestra, particularly a concerto, uh, where a solo instrument is set off with a full band of strings and there'll be a bit where the solo instrument plays by himself and then the band comes in. After a while the band lays out, the soloist continues, that sort of thing. That, that was the pattern of a concerto. And uh, Bach apparently would acquire scores, would musical scores, printed scores of, of some of these concerti and, and apparently would study them. And some of his studies appear to be uh, adaptations that he made of these concerti for a keyboard instrument so that he could literally play this Vivaldi concerto, for example, on the keyboard and learn about it that way. Um, so a couple of pieces on the program today are examples of that. There are two actually what were originally Vivaldi concerti that Bach adapted to a keyboard instrument. Uh, one of them will be the opening piece, uh, which he adapted for the organ, or at least an instrument with multiple keyboards and pedals. Um, which for us, the most convenient example of that is the organ. Um, also on the program today is a sonata. This is an original piece of Bach. Um, you may notice on your program, which I hope you uh, opened up from the link below the screen here, um, you may notice uh, aside the title of sonata, it says in parentheses trio, or do I have that backwards? Trio, sonata, one way or the other, whatever. Um, the, uh, the, the trio sonata, as it was known, was a sonata for three instruments. Um, but you notice there's just one instrument here. So a, a, a trio sonata on the organ, or again, an instrument with keyboards and a pedal board, uh, was where one person gets to play the part of three instruments. Thank you very much, Bach. And uh, there, there's a story that this was written as a birthday present to one of his sons who apparently was very cocky about his musical abilities and it brought him down to size very quickly. Again, I don't know if that's true, but it's, it's a story that's gotten legs and, and has been retold many times among organ geeks like myself. So I'm, again, I'm glad you could join us today. Um, I think what you'll find, uh, I hope what you'll find, is that uh, that, that sort of buoyancy that you, that you associate with music like composers such as Vivaldi is, is really permeates this music um, very faithfully. Uh, Bach, uh, of course, in his adaptation of Vivaldi for keyboard, I think he really captures it. And then in his own original music in the style, he captures it as well. So despite his uh, fair, um, not so widely traveled uh, life, um, he certainly absorbed a lot through the means that, that were available to him. So I don't know if you've noticed that uh, there is a chat uh, capability here on YouTube Live. Uh, it looks like a few people have noticed. And uh, so if, as, as time permits, I'll be happy to answer some questions uh, as best as I can. Hello, hello, yes, hello, good to have you. Um, uh, no questions yet, all right? But, but some, some of you are here, that's good to hear. How are we doing on time? Um, one minute. So it looks like uh, if we have a question, we have one minute for it. Go. Or maybe not. Anyone? That's okay. It's, it's about time to start. So uh, looks like that's going to be it. I guess I was just so thorough that there's nothing to ask. Well, that's cool. I, I can I can live with that. 
Okay, looks like that's it. All right, thank you all for joining us. We'll be beginning very shortly. Just in case you are concerned about the, uh, the lovely person to my right who is handling my page turns, uh, if you're concerned about the social distancing factor and all that, I do assure you that this lovely lady here is someone with whom I live. So we are fully compliant. <laughs>
So maybe you could you could hear the uh, the difference between when the soloist was playing and when the whole band was playing, and when the when the soloist was playing with the band, everybody was going together. I think Bach uh, really did a nice job of uh, capturing that, even though it was just for for the keyboards instead of a, a whole band. And um, I think you also you get a good example in that at the contrast between the the, the really buoyant, cheerful. Fast movements, first and third movements, and the really expressive, lovely expressiveness, expressiveness of, of the slower middle movements. So uh, next, we're going to get an example of how Bach uh, achieved that in an original piece, uh, one of the trio sonatas. So you'll notice the um, the Italian words underneath the title in your program that designates the uh, the uh, directives. They're not really titles of the movements, but they're, they're tempo markings, basically. So vivace, which is Italian for lively. Uh, the slow middle movement, lente. I'm not sure where Bach uh, got that version of lento, but uh, there it is. And then allegro, fast, for the third one. So there you go, fast, slow, fast. Happy outer movements, first and third, and a really lovely expressive middle movement.
Bach didn't just write uh, transcriptions, adaptations of concerti for the organ, also for a keyboard instrument without pedals, and that gives us the opportunity to hear from the harpsichord. Now, the harpsichord is not here at the church. It's at the house. It's in quarantine, like, like many of us. So this, actual next, this next piece actually was recorded earlier, about 24 hours ago, actually, in case you're wondering, um, and will be played for you now. This is the uh, concerto, originally a violin concerto by Vivaldi, as adapted for the keyboard by Bach.
Well, how's that for a perfect example of Vivaldi's three movements, frolicky, playful, joyous outer movements, first and third, and this, this beautifully lyric and expressive middle movement. These, I don't know what, what these Italians were drinking, but boy, they, they, they had it down. And, and so did uh, Bach, I think, when he, uh, he absorbed it very well. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, really miss having you here. Uh, this is absolutely no substitute for a live audience, believe me. So, uh, but glad you could join us. So for this final piece, uh, some might actually be, be led to ask, what does the Toccata in C have to do with Bach's Italian influence? I'm glad you asked. Uh, the, uh, the Toccata in C, we did mention earlier, Toccata is an Italian word. Um, German organists tended to write toccatas, particularly in generations ahead of Bach, that were much more in the old school, older Italian style of that sort of more condensed, not really independent movements, just short, short sections. Um, sometimes with that fast, slow, fast um, structure, but nothing like the three movements that we see now in this newer Italian style. And um, so this, this piece, which Bach called the Toccata in C, is actually an example of Bach taking this older form and expanding it into a form that looks a lot more like the Italian sonata or concerto in that just three distinct movements. These movements could be independent pieces. In fact, I've, I've heard them played as independent pieces. Um, they're, they're, they're that extensive and, and able to stand on their own that well. But of course, Bach intended them to be heard in a sequence just as Vivaldi would have heard those three movements of the concerto to be heard in sequence. So we have these three distinct movements. He calls the whole thing Toccata, but again, expanded three movements. And so what we have now is the opening section, which kind of in the old German Toccata fashion is very flamboyant. Uh, fingers just dancing all over the place, and even in this case, an extended pedal solo. That's a bonus for you. Um, then a lively, generally fast opening movement. Uh, the middle movement, slower, more expressive, more contemplative, and he even uses an Italian word. Now, we, don't, we haven't seen this much before Bach's time in, uh, in keyboard music by German composers, using Italian words, but that's how much of a thing it's become now. So he calls this middle section adagio, slow in Italian. And then the final section, which again is fast and florid and buoyant, uh, is a fugue, something a little more old German in, in style, but um, in a much more dancey fashion uh, than might be typical. And in fact, uh, this fugue sounds almost like a dance known as the gig. Um, and that's going to be more the theme of next week's program, by the way, the influence of, of dance music in Bach. So we get a little foretaste of that today. So this will sometimes be called, again, by those of organ geekery like myself, uh, this piece will often be referred to as the Toccata, Adagio, and Fugue in C, which is descriptive. It, it, it uh, points out the fact that it's three, really three full movements in, in the style of the Italian concerto. But here it is, the Toccata in C.
Yay, Bach! Thank you again so much for joining us. Really so sorry that we, we can't gather in person. It's just not the same. Really miss having you here. But so glad you could join us. I hope you'll join us again next week. Same time. We'll start again at 445 with the pre-concert talk. And concert at 5 o'clock. We'll talk about Bach's sweet life next week. Thank you again, everybody. Stay well. Stay safe. See you next week, I hope.